Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Chandra Weigel. I'm with AARP here in the Houston uh, area. And I want to welcome you today to um, a um, event that we're doing in partnership with South Texas College of Law. And uh, we've been doing uh, this particular presentation for the last, I think, three or four years. Um, and it's been one of our more successful and well-attended uh, presentations. So I guarantee you, you're going to learn a lot. Um, and I want to uh, thank Crystal Washington, who's a clinical teaching fellow at the South Texas College of Law, for uh, partnering with us every year. She reached out to us several years ago, and we have been uh, doing the, this particular presentation, like I said, for the last couple of years. So welcome. Um, I have put in the chat uh, my information. That is my direct line number, as well as my email. If you have any questions about the presentations or recordings, any of that, you can get that from me. Um, the one thing I do encourage you to do is to let Crystal get through the presentation and then kind of save your questions um, uh, when she opens it up for Q&A. Um, so without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Crystal and uh, thank all of you again and thank you, Crystal, for uh, helping us out here again. Uh, definitely my pleasure. Thank you, Chandra, for the warm introduction. Um, as Chandra said, I'm a staff attorney actually now with mm -hmm. South Texas College of Law Legal Clinic. Um, we are um, a fully functioning law firm on the 10th floor at South Texas College of Law Houston. We are open and we are taking clients uh, for the fall. We do not charge for our legal services as long as our clients meet the income requirements um, for our clinic. We have about, I don't wanna get this number wrong, but we're, we've got about over 20 clinics. I think about 23 clinics right now. Um, the one that I am representing today is the estate planning clinic, which is, uh, it always is, I mean, they've always got tons of clients um, and it is a will drafting um, clinic that um, drafts wills and powers of attorney and directives and things like that. I don't teach that clinic. I actually teach the probate clinic and the guardianship clinic. And probate is after the person has passed, we help to settle that estate. And the guardianship clinic um, is, to, um, is a legal declaration of incapacity over a person who needs a guardianship. Um, so I will put our information on the um, uh, not the chat, I'll put it on the screen uh, at the end. And I am always happy to uh, hear from you all after the presentation is over. Um, just to let me know your thoughts and let me know if you have any questions. Um, today, we are going to be talking about um, a topic that I'm excited about. Um, and it's still something that you can benefit from, even though COVID-19 has kind of taken our nation by storm for lack of a better term. Um, so I think what helps is if I just go ahead and start the PowerPoint and I'm gonna go ahead and share the screen. And if any of you are having trouble seeing this, shoot me a, a, a private message in the chat and we can see what the, the problem is, okay? All right. I'm assuming everyone can see this. Give me a thumbs up if you can. I can see it. Do y'all know, you know, you know how to do the thumbs up? Something I learned recently. Okay, Marcia knows how to do the thumbs up. Okay, cool. Okay, so I start this presentation called it, Why Todd, right? Like I thought that I just having a will was enough, okay? Some of you already have wills. If you're comfortable, um, you know, sharing this information, give me a thumbs up if you've already heard of or know someone who has done the transfer on death deed. A few of you, okay. Cool, give me a thumbs up if you've never heard of the transfer on death deed and have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay. All right, so I'm just gonna uh, explain exactly what it is. Um, a transfer on death deed is, or, or what we call a Todd, okay, 
it is a deed, okay, that a person signs during their lifetime. The person who signs it is called the grantor. They are the owner of a piece of real property. When we talk about transfer on death deeds, we are not talking about any personal property. We're talking about land, homes, okay? Um, so it's a deed that has the legal effect of transferring real property upon the death of that owner, okay? So it takes effect after the death of the owner. And so what does this mean for us? This means that probate is not necessary if you've done a transfer on death deed with regard to the real property because the terms of the deed are going to be honored and made legal without having to go to probate court. And that means for the person who has properly executed one, um, their family is going to uh, forego that expense. They are going to um, be relieved of the expense of sometimes having to deal with uh, with, with the expense that comes along with probate, and it is expensive, and I can, uh, I can talk about those numbers later. Um, the deed names a beneficiary to receive real property upon the owner's death, okay? Um, I find it helpful to just actually show you the deed and go through it. Why does the transfer on death deed exist, and when did it come into existence? So the transfer on death deed was birthed formally on September 1st, 2015. I've got a message here, one moment. Okay, so I am going to get to that. Um, great question, uh, Laura. I'm gonna get to that. Um, yes, it does uh, with regard to the real property, but we're gonna talk about that later. That's actually in the presentation, is that okay? Okay, so in September of 2015, something, um, pretty dramatic happened here in Texas, and Hurricane Ike was that um, occurrence, okay? And what happened was there were people who were displaced, and they were looking for a means to have their home repaired after the hurricane. Uh, a hurricane can be, can be devastating. I have had clients who have had anything, anywhere from small leaks to entire parts of their roof missing. Okay, and we all know that that's unlivable. And so when these people were applying for some sort of federal aid to get their homes fixed, they were told they don't own the home. Okay, that's a big deal because these um, entities are, are sometimes requiring 100% ownership. Okay, um, and so Texas said, okay, we've got to do something for people who don't necessarily have the money to afford an estate planning attorney, which is also expensive. Um, we need a way that they can do this with a few self-help um, tools to get a deed drafted, to transfer real property in an inexpensive way so that the next generation can benefit from that inheritance without having to go through probate. That makes sense, right? Um, the sad part is that Texas was like the la one of the last jurisdictions to adopt um, something in the form of a transfer on death deed. Other jurisdictions have had this like thin had it, you know, like from years past and we're kind of, we just got on the boat, but better late than never. Um, I know that it's called a toady in some jurisdictions. If you just do a quick Google search, you can see that it's called different things, but it has the same relative principle behind it all. And so with that, um, Texas passed the Real Property Transfer on Death Act, legitimizing Todd's in this state, okay? And if I could go to the next slide, that would be one more message here. Yes, uh, the record, it is recording from what I understand this presentation right now, and um, Chandra can make this available to you later. Okay, so the terms of the Todd. Uh, first, we're going to look at the Todd, but I want, before we do that, to actually just look at a few things on the PowerPoint first. Um, there are some terms on the Todd. Um, okay, thank you, Chandra. There is a first owner and a second owner. Um, some Todd's only have one owner. As you know, sometimes only one person owns a property. 
and sometimes more than one person owns a piece of real property, okay? We're gonna look at the legal description of the property. Um, it's very important that on the transfer on death deed, we have a proper legal description. This is different from your physical address. The legal description of your property is going to be a longer, more um, convoluted sentence that has the map of the plat thereof, and it's going to lay out all of the, um, all of the details of this plat of property that your um, that your that your house sits on. Okay, so it's very important to get that right on your transfer on death deed. If you don't know your the legal description of your property, what I like to do is first go to the legal description on the tax bill, but don't use that on your transfer on death deed. I only use that as a means to confirm the address that I'm looking up on the appraisal district is the correct one. And then I go to the clerk's website, okay? So if it's in Fort Bend County, you're gonna look at the Fort Bend County Real Property Records. If it's in Harris County, you're looking at the Harris County Real Property Records. You're searching, you're doing a search there, okay, for the deed um, to your property. And on there, you'll see a much longer description that is the one that you need to use, not the shorter one that comes on your tax bill, okay? And um, I'm not saying that the transfer won't happen properly if you only use the description on your tax bill. I'm just warning against not doing it because it's really um, an incomplete description, okay? Then the address of the property needs to be on the transfer on death deed. That's 555 Smith Street. That's where you live, right? And then we're gonna look at primary alternate beneficiaries, and then we're gonna look at our options for transfer. So with that being said, I'm gonna go ahead and put the transfer on death deed up. Before I do that, I'm gonna give you a fair warning that the transfer on death deed used to be a less complex document with regard to the form that they use on texaslawhelp.org, okay? That's just my opinion. Um, you can look at all of the controversy that surrounded whether we should change the form, should it be more user friendly, should we, an should we add what's called anti-lapse language to it or will that confuse people. Um, and the legislature I think got it right. Um, the form for the most part is user friendly and if you follow the directions, if you take a whole day to yourself, get this transfer done correctly while reading direction, while reading the directions, I think you can do it. But the old form was a lot easier if you, if you ask me. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to try to break down um, how the form works. And please don't shoot the messenger. I did not create the form. I will try to explain it as best as possible, though there are some really strange things in there that I think could frustrate people who are trying to make sense of the form. Okay, so let me share that. And by the way, you are not bound to a form. You can, tr you can draft your own transfer on death deed um, by yourself, though I don't you know, recommend it. Um, okay, so there's instructions and these instructions can be found and I'll put the website up again, is texaslawhelp.org, texaslawhelp.org, okay? So we talked about that, um, that property owner, correct? The first uh, thing on the transfer on death deed on texaslawhelp.org says, obviously read all the instructions on the form. It's always best to talk to a lawyer before using this form, and it is. If you have a friend who's an attorney who, who, who knows about real property, by all means run this by them um, if they're at your disposal. Uh, let me check the chat really quickly. I got a question. Actually, it's not letting me check it. I'll get, I'll get back to the chat. Sorry about that. Okay, I'll look at that in a moment. Um, okay, so you're not gonna file the instructions. When you're filing the deed, you're just gonna start where it says transfer on death deed and then the applicable pages, all right? So right here, it says you've gotta sign uh, and date the transfer on death deed in front of a notary. So you're not gonna sit at home, sign this and then say, oops, I was supposed to do this in front of a notary. Um, right now, with regard to COVID-19, I know that online notaries are being utilized a lot. Um, 
if you can safely get to a notary, great. But I, if you can't and you know that you're in a high risk um, age group or something like that, you may want to Google some online notaries. Um, right now we're doing notarizations by Zoom. Uh, my paralegal gets on with me. I sign in front of her to so, show that I have the mental capacity to sign something. I forward it to her. She notarizes it, right? And that's how that works. All right. So here. Um, the first page of the transfer on death deed is going to lay out the property owner, okay? So some, somebody uh, owns the property. Someone has to own the property, okay? And that's where your name goes right here. Property owner's printed name. Don't use a nickname. Don't use a name if you have not legally changed your name yet. Say if you got married, but you still have like your, your old name, whatever your name legally is, you're going to put that right there, okay? And if there is a second owner, you're going to put that owner's name there. Make sense? And then addresses are going to go below. This is where you are currently living. Okay? So that's the first part of the deed. Then we talked about the legal description of the property. The legal description, again, is not the mailing or physical address of the property. It's that long convoluted paragraph of the map of the plat thereof, page 65, in the subdivision of. That's that long description and make sure that you write it correctly. If you're not absolutely sure about what the legal description of your property is, talk to a lawyer, try to call the clerk's office, okay? Um, number three is, your, um, is the address of the property that you wish to transfer upon your death, okay? And that goes right here. That is your 222 Smith Street, county, state, and zip code, okay? Now, for those of you who like to skip ahead, I'm a skip aheader. Um, I'm like that too. I, I, what's next? Get to it, Crystal. I would encourage you to not do that at this moment. Otherwise, you're going to confuse yourself. Okay? But let's take the sections one at a time. Okay? You will, if you are a human being with blood running through your veins, you will fit into category A, B, or C. It is also in the alternative impossible to fit into more than A, B, or C. You will only fit into one, okay, with regard to this form. So which one is A? A is this. If this is you, listen up. A is the section that applies to community property. This is property that two people purchased together during their marriage and upon their death, they would like to transfer their one half interest to that spouse. That's all A does, okay? That's it. Don't go to B or C yet. Stay with A. A again is both spouses own the property, okay? They purchased it during their marriage and they want to leave their half to the surviving spouse. That's it. That's actually what the deed says on number one. The owners of this property are married to each other and both are signing this deed. So there's got to be agreement there. If one of us dies and the other is living, the living spouse will be the sole owner of the property. Do you see that on number one? Okay. All right. Alternate beneficiaries. Also community property, and I get this a lot. Um, sadly, I do get couples who are, um, estranged from one another when one of them passes away, but they're still legally married. That's still this. Um, estranged does not mean divorced. Um, or I get um, a, a, sur a surviving husband who says, well, I bought the property, right, um, with my own money. I said, were you married when you purchased it? Well, yeah, then it's half Hers, okay, so, so that's another thing. In Texas, they're going to presume that anything purchased during marriage is community property, okay? Okay, during marriage, purchased during marriage, all right? Alternate beneficiaries. When we are both deceased, I'm looking right here, when we are both deceased, both have to die, both spouses have to die in order for the alternate beneficiary to take. When we are both deceased, we want the following person or persons to own our property. This person may or may not be our child. 
uh, descendant or member of our family, if more than one alternate beneficiary is listed, if more than one alternate beneficiary is listed, these two people will own the property in equal shares, okay? I gave this presentation to a group of attorneys one time and they kept arguing that the second alternate takes it if the alternate dies before. And that isn't what this says. This says that once both primary, excuse me, both spouses die, the alternate takes. And if you choose more than one alternate, then they take in equal shares. Okay. All right. I don't recommend that because I see the disaster that happens when a couple tries to be fair to both kids and leave the property to them in equal shares. On the surface, it sounds like a good idea, but I see the disaster that happens afterwards when the children cannot agree what to do with the property. One gets left with paying the taxes, the other's living there, not contributing to the taxes. So we'll get to how to deal with that family situation uh, in a minute, okay? So the alternate beneficiary takes in, if the primary beneficiary dies before, okay? And then here comes the strange part. The legislature could not get around having to add the anti-lapse, okay? So I'm just gonna read through it. At my death, I convey or I give to the primary beneficiary, that's the wife, the this husband, the first preferred, my interest in the property to have and to hold forever, all right? But if my primary beneficiary does not survive me, meaning dies before me, I give it to my alternate beneficiary or beneficiaries, right? If my alternate beneficiary is my child or brother or sister, and the alternate beneficiary dies before I do, I grant and convey my share to any living alternate beneficiary. And so option A says the alternate beneficiary's share will pass to his surviving children. And the second alternate beneficiary will own it in conjunction with those children. Or B says no one else, okay? I only want the second alternate beneficiary to take, okay? B also says if no alternate beneficiary survives me, then the deed doesn't exist anymore. It says that there's no one else to leave it to, okay? Now that's the confusing part for some people. Um, if it's confusing you right now, don't worry, we can answer questions later. I, I can even talk to you um, after the presentation is over. Um, if you want to email me, I'm happy to answer those questions. But these things necessarily comes up, like what if the alternate beneficiary dies before also? Do I want only the second to keep and share it with this person's dis, uh, descendants? Or do I want them not to and I just want the second, second alternate beneficiary to take? What if I don't name an alternate? What if both alternates die? So they had, they couldn't get around it. Do you see that? Okay. So that's A. A is, I am a married person. This is community property. I want to leave my half to my spouse when I die, and then you name an alternate, okay? All right, B. B is uh, what I like to call a separate property clause, which means, but it only, it only applies again to married people. So a person who is legally married but owns a piece of separate property. And just to be clear, a piece of separate property is a property that I owned before I got married, okay? Or property that I inherited while I got married, like I had a rich uncle who died and left me a mansion in my dreams, right? But I had an uncle leave me something in a will. I probated his will during my marriage. I inherited that. That is my separate property, okay? or someone who gifted a piece of property to me during my marriage, okay? Um, that is separate property, okay? So this, this section B um, is a gracious deed that says, I want my spouse to be the beneficiary of my separate property 
um, when I die. That's what B does. B says, yes, I own this separate property. I am married. And when I die, I want my spouse to have that separate property. Okay. And the spouse goes right here. Spouse's printed name, spouse's mailing address right here. Okay. Alternate beneficiaries. What if my spouse dies before me? Eek. No problem at all. Go ahead and name an alternate beneficiary right here. Okay. My son, Roger. Okay. And then if you name a second alternate beneficiary, my daughter, Sheila, Roger and Sheila will own it in, in equal shares, which again, I don't recommend, but that's your choice. Okay. Um, and then you have that anti-lapse um, option. Okay. At my death, I convey to my primary beneficiary, my interest in the property, my spouse to have it to hold forever. But if she dies before me, I'm going to give it to my alternate beneficiary. And if that alternate beneficiary is my child, my brother or sister, and the alternate beneficiary dies before I do, I, do I want my second alternate beneficiary and the alternate beneficiary's descendants to own it in equal shares? Or do I just, which is A, or do I want the second alternate beneficiary to own it and no one from the descendant line of this person? And if I don't have any alternates, or if they all died before me, then the deed is of no effect, which is also B, okay? And that's B. So we got A, community property spouse, B, separate property to my spouse, and then C is literally everybody else in the world. I'm a single person who wants to leave it to my veterinarian for my cat, whatever. Um, I'm a married person who doesn't want to leave my share to my spouse, which is tragic, uh, but it happens and that's going to cause a lot of confusion. Um, so yeah, C, like I said, if you're a red-blooded human being, you'll fit into any of these categories, okay? So I want the following people or per person to own my property, um, may not be a family member. If more than one primary beneficiary is listed, they're going to own it in equal shares. So uh, just say I'm a single, person, my name's Sheila, and I want to leave my property to my friend Roger. Roger's the primary beneficiary, okay? All right, and then um, if all my primary beneficiaries die before me, I want the following person to own my property. So say this person doesn't survive you, you've already named an alternate beneficiary to take, okay? And so here, it gives you these options. Remember the primary beneficiary is the first preferred at the top. If my primary beneficiary is my child or brother or sister and dies before I do, I grant and convey my share to any living primary beneficiary, okay? And do I want the descendants of the other primary beneficiary to own equally with that primary or do, do I want the buck to stop here and only this primary beneficiary, okay? And those are options A or B. What about if no primary beneficiary survives me? and all I have is alternates, okay? If my primary beneficiary is my child or brother or sister and all primary beneficiaries die before I do, I grant and convey my share to the deceased, uh, excuse me, and convey my share to the deceased primary beneficiary's share is gonna pass to his or her surviving children and under other descendants uh, or to the alternate beneficiary or beneficiaries, okay? I do not want the deceased primary beneficiary's surviving children or other descendants to have a share of the property. If no primary beneficiary is alive when I die and I did not choose an alternate beneficiary, this deed is canceled. There's no one else to leave it to. And you have the same option for the alternate beneficiaries. If none of them survive you, then the, uh, it's as if the deed never existed. Or do I want A, the deceased alternate beneficiary share to pass to their descendants, okay? Um, so they had to add that in there because there was just no way around it. Um, so you're going to choose A, B, or C for, your, uh, for yourself, and only those pages are the pages that need to be filed, okay? Like if I'm in category A, I don't need to file page B. You know, it'll save you money. Um, and then comes the last page, which is the notary block. So make sure that you're in front of a licensed notary whose stamp is not expired 
um, and you're going to sign and date in their presence and just make sure that they fill it out properly. I see a lot of notaries, especially on wills that don't, that it's not executed properly. Um, just make sure that they have state of where, where you did it and where, in which county you were in when you signed the um, transfer on death deed. Make sure that the notary dates it. Make sure that he or she signs it and make sure there's a notary stamp. When you're done, check the notary stamp because it may say that, oh, it expired in 1902. Oh, okay, well, great. You're not supposed to be notarizing documents anymore. Um, but I'm just kidding. Just make sure it's up to date. And then you're going to put your recording address here. Once you file it and pay the fee, they're going to mail you a certified copy of the transfer on death deed so that you can have it for your records. Okay. That is the entire deed, but there's more to discuss with regard to the transfer on death deed. Okay. Okay, so regarding A, B, and C, do we leave those blank if the name beneficiaries are not relatives? Yes, because those only apply to what's called someone in our consanguinity. Um, they're trying to address what the, what the legislature will assume that you would have wanted to do with your property, and that only applies to blood relatives, okay? And we're going to get to how you revoke this in a moment. And yes, I will provide the form. Sorry, that's my youngest. I'm trying to get through this. Okay, so we went over, oh, I'm sorry, I need to share this. I'm gonna put the PowerPoint back up. Okay. Okay, so we talked about options A, B, or C, and then remember that it's got to be notarized, okay? Not just signed, but notarized. Okay, and primary beneficiary we learned was the first preferred beneficiary. The alternate beneficiary takes title to property if the primary beneficiary does not su survive the grantor by 120 hours. Um, the 120 hour rule is a default rule, meaning in order to inherit this property, you're going to have to be alive for at least 120 hours after the other person, after the grantor has died. Okay, and most people meet that requirement. Um, if the only beneficiary on the deed does not meet the 120 hour rule, the property is treated as if the Todd never existed. Okay, can you excuse me for one moment? I will be right back. Okay, and um, this uh, last clause on here was true about the last form. Um, no, that's true now. Designating a primary and alternate beneficiary does not form a joint tenancy. Remember, there's first and second primary, and then there's first and second alternate. Okay, so once you've properly drafted this, uh, Todd, um, and if you want to run it by our clinic, we're happy to look at those also. In fact, we do them in the estate planning clinic. Um, uh, and it's notarized properly. Um, I had to make some changes because of COVID-19 in here. This deed needs to be filed in the county where the property is actually located while you are still alive. Okay. And I say that with my eyes big during these presentations because I feel like some people are gonna get this notarized, they're gonna do everything properly and it's going to sit on their shelf and it'll never be filed and it never takes legal effect unless it's been recorded in the real property records in the county where the property sits. Right now in Harris County, um, and you can go on the clerk's website, they are doing uh, all recordings by mail right now so you can mail your deed in, and we can talk about the price in a minute. I have it on the next slide. 
Um, okay, so that's filed in the real property records by mail. I think you can send in a credit card form too to download it from the clerk's website, fill it out, and then they process the payment there. Um, and I think you can also send in a cashier's check with the price on it um, and then they'll do it. Um, but you can't go in person now because of the virus. So it's been, frust it's been frustrating because I'm used to just going in person. Um, okay, so once this, uh, this deed is properly filed in the real property rec records where the, where the uh, property sits, and then the grantor passes away, the beneficiary of the property must take something called an affidavit of death. That's also on texaslawhelp.org, okay? They must have survived the grantor by 120 hours. They take an affidavit of death or mail, rather, an affidavit of death um, to the real property records with a fee. I would accompany it with a death certificate or an obituary or both. Um, and again, this is going to be done by mail. The real property records will record it, making the, benefic the, the beneficiary on the top the new owner of the real property. Okay. Um, and I want to do this, I want to say this as a caution to, um, to everyone listening. Uh, the owner of the property has to have contractual capacity at signing. Um, they have to be functioning with a sound mind in order to do this. The whole process can be done correctly. If the person lacked the ability to appreciate the consequences of what they were signing, the deed is null and it can, it can be nullified, okay? And I say that because I see this a lot in my practice, people getting um, mom whose cognitive functioning is declining severely to deed them. Uh, her interest in their property, and it happens all the time, and it's, um, it's, it's terrible. So if you know someone who is, you know, being subjected to things like this, is starting to decline, is signing things and all of that, just, um, you may want to do a, a real property record search um, and just make sure they haven't signed anything like this, because it's their real property, and if they can't sign it, then it's too late. Um, TexasLawHelp.org is a great do-it-yourself resource. Um, if you really just can't get to an, an attorney and we, you know, have too many cases, um, try TexasLawHelp.org and really read the instructions. Go slowly through the deed. Um, it is not as easy as, as the old deed. Um, and then remember, you're, you're not confined to a form. but it's helpful, the form is helpful. Okay, uh, also, yeah, if, you're, if your property, I'm all, I only deal really with real property in Harris County, but check all of the clerk's web, websites or give the county real property records a call and ask them what their current method of filing is. So if the property is in Montgomery County and you wanna file a Todd there, I would just call them and say, hey, do you all have a drop box? Are you, did this, does this need to be by certified mail? I mean, we'll just give them a call, right? And just figure it out. Right now, the Harris County Real Property Records, here are their prices. Recording is by mail. It's $18 for the first page and then $4 for every page thereafter. Um, there is a credit card authorization form. Um, I am not comfortable filling that out for clients. We typically just wait for checks to be issued by our accounting department and we um, will forward the check to them. Um, cashier's check um, works also. And then also, if you're going to do this on your own, I recommend a really short instructive letter to the real property records to whom it may concern please record in the real property records and send me a certified copy and closed is my transfer on death deed and my form of payment. Should you have any questions, contact me at 555, you know, 2222. Okay. For some reason, I cannot see you all's questions while I am sharing my screen. Really weird. Give me one second. Let me see if I can look because I know a few came down. All right, 
I'm going to have to let those wait till the end. I'm sorry. Um, so there's no notice requirement for the transfer on death deed. So a beneficiary is going to be surprised that they're in receipt of this property because there's no notice requirement. A notice requirement and acceptance is something that's required in contract law, but that's for someone who's alive. We know that this deed doesn't take effect until your death. And so um, there's, you can't notice a person if you are deceased. Um, there's no delivery, no acceptance, and no consideration. Um, so you won't see the little for the sum of $10 or for the sum of $100 because you can't give consideration to someone who's passed away. So how do I remedy this? Well, let the beneficiary know what you're doing. Um, typically in my practice, people know who they want to leave their property to. They, they know um, within the, the first, or, or they've known for a long time. They are going to want to have, or you're going to want to have a conversation with your beneficiary and tell them what you're about to do. You may be surprised to learn that the person doesn't even want the property. They may not be able to afford the taxes on, their prop on the property. Um, and so you may be having someone in mind, but you may need to change your mind about who you want to leave your property to, but have a conversation with the beneficiary. Let them know that, you know, once you pass, you're going to need to, you know, um, file an affidavit of death. A lot of people just don't know to do that. Um, so, so yeah, that's important. Um, I think that a beneficiary, I mean, again, there's no case law on this yet, but I think a beneficiary cannot be forced to accept the gift of real property. I think they can file a formal disclaimer in the real property record says, thanks mom, but no, no thanks. I, you know, don't want this property. I think it's only done after the, after the death because the deed only takes effect after the grantor's death. And so um, it follows that the person will not have inherited the property until the person dies. So they can't disclaim it before the person dies. Okay. Okay. So you need to analyze whether a Todd would work for you. When do I recommend a Todd? I recommend a transfer on death deed when the person's estate is mostly made up of real property. I mean, like really all I have is this house. Okay very little personal property and you want to leave this real property to a beneficiary when you die without the hassle and cost of probate, okay? Um, in my practice, we do take uh, under income clients. We see a lot of generational poverty where the person who passed away is not only under income, but the beneficiaries are also under income. And so it's like, you know, I, I need to be able to probate this will and get $4,000 out of mom's account and get the property into my name, um, you know, without having to pay, you know, all this money. And I think the Todd does that. I think the Todd gives that beneficiary the freedom to not have to pay um, a probate attorney. Uh, I recommend it for those who have beneficiaries, therefore, who will likely not be able to afford probate. And that is not an insult. Probate is expensive. Um, we would sometimes have probates that were more expensive than the property that we were trying to transfer. Um, $8,000, $10,000 worth of attorney's fees for just to get a house into. I mean, that's a lot of money. I don't recommend them for taxable estates. Um, right now, you're only rich if you have $11 million or more. So if you have $10 million, no, I'm kidding. But I don't recommend them for taxable estates. I think that um, in those cases, the person needs to get some, hire an attorney and get, you know, get a trust attorney, maybe a trust set up and see what they can do. Not saying you can't. With the transfer on death, you could transfer a castle with it. There's nothing prohibiting you from doing that. Um, it's just that there are some benefits to having trust set up if you have that much money and that many assets. Okay, so one of you asked Todd versus Will. Well, I already have a Will. Why, why are you even talking to me today? I get it. Uh, a Todd is more cost effective. Currently, we looked at those prices for the Todd. The cost to file is uh, $50. I mean, less than $50. Um, probate can start with a new, an initial retainer, and this was our initial retainer to even start work, was uh, $2,500, and it would go up for that from there. And the client is also responsible for any court fees in addition to the um, 
attorney's fees, right? So it just, it kind of, we just saw it kind of go up and up and they would bill over the retainer. And I'm thinking this person's just trying to transfer one piece of property. Um, and so that was what we, you know, did when I was working in private practice. Um, a tie is not a substitute for a will, okay? What do I mean by that? Um, well, let's get back to that in a minute. What I try to do in my estate planning, and yes, I do probate, but I also do a fair share of estate planning. I consider gifting during lifetime and keeping as much out of the estate as possible so that by the time you pass away, probating your will is almost optional, okay? Because everything has been dealt with outside of probate. Um, <clears throat> consider gifting to your, during your lifetime, especially if you have some sort of um, imminent threat to your life, imminent danger, excuse me, um, your death is imminent, right? Like I have stage four cancer, I'm not going to survive another month. Go ahead and start giving your assets to people as gifts so that when you die, they aren't fighting over things that you clearly gave with the intent to give, okay? Um, wedding rings, large pieces of jewelry and things like that are good. That Those are good things to do. They actually relieve a lot of issues after. Um, people don't think about gifting during lifetime. Um, a payable on death account, naming a beneficiary on your bank account so that you don't have, that doesn't fall under the will by the time you pass away, right? Like you've already got a beneficiary on the account and then it's governed by its terms and passes outside of probate, okay? If you have a life insurance policy, make sure you've named a beneficiary on the life insurance policy. A lot of life insurance policies are left open-ended and name no beneficiary, and then they come under the estate and have to be probated. So we wanna keep as much as possible out of the estate. With regard to the Todd, it would take care of the real property, okay? keeping that out of the estate, okay? The Todd is going, because a Todd is a contract and a will is a testamentary document, the terms of the Todd are going to trump the terms of the will, even if you did a will after you did a Todd, okay? It's very serious. So the beneficiary named in your Todd is going to inherit, not the person named in the will with regard to your real property. So if I leave Black Acre, to Susan in my will. I leave Black Acre to Susan in my will, okay? Um, and then I draft a Todd that says, I leave Black Acre to John. John is going to get it because John's in the Todd, okay? And I change my mind later and say, oh, I did that Todd leaving it to John. I'm gonna make a will, okay, leaving Black Acre to Gregory guess what? John still gets the property because the will is not going to trump the Todd, okay? So we'll talk about what to do with that situation in a minute. Okay, so how to cancel a Todd. Um, you cannot cancel a Todd by ripping up that certified copy that comes back to you in the mail. It doesn't do anything because it's already been recorded, okay? You can revoke a Todd by recording a subsequent Todd. I changed my mind about who I want to leave my profit property to. And so you're going to record a new transfer on death deed with the real property records and the latest in time, the, yeah, the latest in time will trump. Okay. So the, the recorder will look at the dates. Okay. This was filed years later. That most recent one is going to trump. Okay. Remember that you don't give up any rights um, to your property until you pass away in the transfer on death deed, which is why I like the transfer on death deed. It empowers the person who is the owner of the property. So guess what? If you sell your property after recording and executing and recording a Todd, it renders the Todd void because you're not giving up any of your, what we call the bundle of rights um, until you uh, die. So that means you can collateralize it. You can do whatever you want with the property, okay? Um, okay, uh, texaslawhelp.org also has a cancellation form. Like you just don't want anything to do with Todd's anymore. You don't wanna leave another Todd. You just don't want anything to do with any of this. There's just a cancellation form that just revokes everything you did and it's just erased, okay? so. 
you can look at that website and there's the cancellation form. It has the whole package right there. Um, and again, we know that a Todd cannot be revoked by a will. Some more important Todd facts. I just talked about this. The Todd does not affect any property rights during your lifetime. So you've signed a Todd, you've recorded it, and now you're scared because son knows that you've executed this, okay? And now he's coming into your house and he's telling you which carpet is better for your home, which shingles look the best on your home. You haven't died yet. It's still your property. So you need to make sure that you understand that under the law, he has no rights to your property until you pass away, okay? And remember, you can only transfer what you own. So if, if you have community property and then you've chosen C, which gives your half to somebody else that's not your spouse, um, you're only transferring your one half, okay? The same goes for the cancellation. You're canceling that half of the transfer, okay? Um, a Todd is not going to protect the property from some creditor claims. So it's subject, the beneficiary is going to take the property subject to all mortgages, liens, and claims. If the taxes were not being paid on the property, the Todd is not going to protect that. There's no way to get around that. Um, and I do get people who sometimes even think that if we start the probate process, that that's going to stop the foreclosure. That's not true either. You can ask them as the attorney, you know, will you have some grace and leniency on this as we're trying to resolve this issue, but they by no means have to slow down the foreclosure process. Okay. Um, what I have seen the Todd do is protect from Medicaid, uh, the Medicaid or estate recovery program. Which, it, which means that, um, long story short, there are some Medicaid programs. I think there's 31 Medicaid programs. This one is the one that cares for um, elders towards the end of their life, either in home or in a skilled nursing facility, and Medicaid pays for it. And then when you pass away, Medicaid attaches a lien, right? <clears throat> it wants to be paid back for what they did for you while you were alive, and they want to be paid back, okay? But those properties are only vul vulnerable if they have been uh, offered for probate in a will, okay? But remember, the transfer on death deed is a non-probate asset, okay, that's governed by its own terms and passes outside of probate. And so once it's recorded, I think it does protect from those Medicaid claims. And I've had a few attorneys back me on this one. Um, the Todd is, what, five years old now, almost five years old. And so we just haven't seen a lot of it, but I think we can with, with, with confidence say that um, anything that's kept out of probate is not subject to a Medicaid lien, okay? Um, one more thing I wanted to be clear about is that a power of attorney cannot create a Todd. Some of you are under powers of attorney meaning someone has decision-making power over you. One thing they cannot decide is that it's in your best interest to draft a Todd, okay? They can't go do it for you and say, you know what, this would definitely benefit Susan if I did a Todd for her leaving everything to George. Yeah, that's what I should do. They're not allowed to do that. Just like a power of attorney can't do a will for you, okay? So just be careful with people who are overstepping their rights with regard to the rights that you've given them, okay? Um, and I know that this seems obvious, but make sure you record the Todd during your lifetime. Don't leave it on the shelf. Make sure you need to get that thing recorded, and then don't forget, okay? Um, if, if you want to change your mind about a beneficiary, do that transfer while you still have capacity. If you know you're cognitive decline is going down, you're going to need to make some estate planning decisions sooner than later. Okay. Some helpful resources. Again, texaslawhelp.org. Um, just go there. Take some free time while we're all at home and look at their transfer on death deed kit. Um, Texas Legal Services Center is just, uh, it's a less comprehensive website, but um, anything on Todd, I try to pull it up and give it to the general public that I think can be helpful. Um, and so take a look at that um, when you have a chance also, but texaslawhelp.org definitely first. 
Okay, and then here's our information. Uh, if you find yourself, you know, and you think you, you would meet our income qualifications, you can shoot me an email. I'm happy to respond back. Chandra knows that when people attend outreaches, I typically, what time is it? Oh, okay. Um, I typically take um, questions. I stay after just like I would normally do, except now we're on, you know, we're online. So I can't really talk with you guys in person. Um, here's my email. Here's our contact information. If someone's passed away and you're like, I don't need any of what you just said, but I need help with this matter. Um, my mom passed away. My dad passed away. We can probably try to help you with that. Um, we have many other clinics, immigration, human trafficking and asylum, family law, um, domestic violence, which sadly we're seeing a rise in. Um, and then recently our landlord tenant clinic has been blowing up because of uh, the unfair treatment of some of the tenants, even because of COVID-19. But we're the Randall O. Sorrells Legal Clinic housed on the 10th floor of South Texas College of Law, Houston. And here is our information. If you need that again, I can, I'm happy to put that in the chat and I can take questions now. Oh, there's a lot of questions. No, there's actually not. So, um, just me. oh, okay, cool. So you can, um, okay, so this is a good question. Do homeowners who live in condos need to do anything in addition to filing uh, the transfer on death deed? Um, so my, my conclusion is this, it's any real property that you own. Okay, so this is not for something that you're renting. A lot of people do purchase condos and they own them. Yeah, I mean, you're gonna, it's, it's a dwelling, a dwelling. So land or any uh, real property, um, you're gonna file it in the county where the property sits. The only thing I would be careful with is mobile homes. There is some shifty case law with regard to whether some mobile homes are considered real property or not. Um, and I just don't remember. I think it has to do with when you purchased it, was it already attached to a piece of land or did you move it like from somewhere else after you purchased it? And so just be careful with that. Um, go back to the person from whom you purchased the mo mobile home from and get the um, closing documents and just see what it's um, characterized at, at, as, excuse me. So I hope that um, another question we have is, can a family member notarize the document? There's nothing prohibiting um, a family member from notarizing the document. But again, since the transfer on death deed has not been with us so long, I would caution against um, anything that you think would ca cause controversy later, um, um, maybe bias or something like that, or we just want to stay away from blood relatives, I think, as much as possible. Um, but if 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 that's your only means of notarizing safely, I think you're okay. Um, I just don't want later on to say, well, why did she notarize the document? Surely, you know, mom didn't have capacity and didn't, of course, she would agree to notarize. I see that happening. So if you don't think that's an issue, then sure. It's different from a ladybird deed uh, in that the Lady Bird deed reserves for the grantor a life estate only. What do I mean by a life estate? When you draft and record a Lady Bird deed, you are only reserving for yourself the right to physical possession of the property while you are alive. Okay? And then when you go to try to sell it, once you've already recorded the Lady Bird deed, you may run into issues because sometimes the beneficiary who, you, who has the vested remainder interest has to now agree that you can sell it. Um, that's why I, I don't hate the Lady Bird deed. I have a love-hate relationship with it because it can be abused. Uh, with the Todd, you are not giving up any of your rights. And I think the legislature also may have done this in a response to the Lady Bird deed having so many issues. Not saying they don't work. I'm just saying they're, they can be a tool of abuse. Let's see, some other questions came up here.
Okay. If my property is in New York State, do I need to get a form from there? Um, yeah. So I don't. I don't practice in New York. I'm not licensed in New York. Um, I can't say whether or not they have the same form of what we have here in Texas. But I would check. I mean, you're going to definitely want to check. Uh, you know, the New York, what, real estate, I mean, I don't know, I, I would just do a quick Google search about, um, you know, New York State and whether they have like a transfer on death deed, it may be called something different, different, um, but check there and they should, I mean, Texas is one of the last jurisdictions to get it, so they may have one, um, and yeah, obviously that wouldn't be filed in, excuse me, Texas, it would be filed there. For this Todd, is clear title required? Yes. Um, so you're going to have to at least be a partial owner of the property um, because remember, you're only deeding what you own. So if you own a fourth of the property and you're deeding it to a friend, um, you're only deeding your one fourth, okay? But if you don't own the property at all, meaning somewhere back in the line, it was never actually transferred to you, you are not transferring anything. Okay, and we run into that issue a lot. And I've had to clear title from grandpa, I mean, great grandpa, down to grandpa, down to mom. And then, you know, it finally became my client's, and then she could will it to someone else. Okay. If there's a mortgage on the property, who is responsible for it after death? The beneficiary is. Okay. And again, um, you, the, the, if, if the person can't pay, the mortgage, then, you know, they can always disclaim the gift, gift because no one can force you, I think, to accept a gift. And in that case, if, if, uh, if a person disclaims the gift, the law is unclear. Um, I, I don't want to say what happens. I think that either the property, if there's no other beneficiaries that were named on the Todd, would probably go into the estate of the deceased person and need to be probated, and it would fall to their heirs at law. Okay, and I think we've addressed how we would revoke this if we wanted to. Okay. Um, where do you file it? I think we've addressed that. <laughs> if there is no one left on the deed as if it never existed, what happens to the property? So it's now become part of probate. Um, so it'll fall either under your will that you've drafted or um, it will fall in test state and then someone will have to go to court or out of court and declare your heirs. Sometimes that's like a distant cousin. I dealt with a lady one time who passed away and she had like no family, like none. Um, I was the ad litem in that case. Like her parents had passed away, her brothers and sisters passed away, all her aunts and uncles passed away. She had no children it was like I had to do a genealogy search. And so in that case, her property as cheated to the state in case an heir turns up. But I have only seen that happen once. Usually people have living heirs, okay? Okay, okay I'm trying to get through all of these. It's so weird not talking to people and hearing voices. I'm not sure if I like this very much. Um, okay. Okay, what if? Okay, so um, what if I want my spouse to be able to live in the home till he dies, then it goes to someone outside of my family. I purchased the home before the marriage. You're in Will's territory right now. Um, it sounds like, so if you don't want to leave the property to your spouse indefinitely, like just give them the actual legal interest in the property, but only the right to possession, you can't do that with a Todd. What you're wanting to do is get a will drafted that leaves a life estate to your spouse, okay? And then in the alternative to once that person passes away, 
or if that person dies before you, then to someone else. Okay, but you can't do abbreviated um, transfers in Todd. It's got to be all or nothing. You've got to give the interest or not. Okay, not, not right to possession. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and attach the form. Did, did, Chandra, were you able to attach the form? Chandra, do you need me to attach the form right now in the chat? I'm gonna make this available to them right now. I'm just gonna go ahead and send it. So, yeah, I did. Um, okay. I, I'm trying to see if, if I can actually attach it. Here's what I'll do for, for the form. Um, if you're unable to pull it on texaslawhelp.org, I'll send a, um, Chandra an email directly after this presentation so that you can have it. Um, you, you don't have to go searching for it. Over to the chat? Hmm? You should be able to drag it over to the chat. You know I'm not tech savvy, but let me, <laughs> let me try this. I, I'm getting, uh, you're getting good. okay, let me try to do this. Okay. All right, here goes nothing. This will either work amazingly or it will totally destroy everything. Okay. Okay. It's not working. It's not working. Okay. No. Nope. Send it to me and I will. Okay. Um, I'll put my email in there several times. But I should be able to do this. I, I, I should be able to, yeah. Okay. I'll get to that in a minute. The phone number to STCL, South Texas College of Law, our clinic is 713-646-2990. That was asked also. I got the say question. It, say it one more time. I'm putting it in chat for you. Seven one. Oh, you know what? I should just do it. Okay. <laughs> what What is wrong with me? Two nine nine zero. Okay. STCL Legal Clinic. Okay. Um. What is a quick claim deed? I got that question. A quick claim deed is a deed that is just basically saying, I don't want an interest in this property and I wanna give it to someone else, okay? Um, what the quick claim deed does is it doesn't warrant anything. They're not saying, I can't promise you that roaches haven't eaten the attic out. I can't promise you, I'm not warranting anything about this house. I'm just, as a gift to you, I don't want it, okay? And what I do, when I do quick claim deeds, it's typically when there's like four like children of a deceased mother or something like that. And she like left it to all four kids, but the family gets along and they all want to deed it to one person. I do a quick claim deed. Um, they weren't living in the property. They can't warrant anything. They don't know anything about it. And so they're just quick claiming their interest. Uh, we do do those in the clinic and it's just a small form. We draft it and we file them in the real property records. Okay, so deed is only under husband's name. We are married. If he passes, does the property go to me? Uh, it depends on when the property was purchased. Was the property purchased during marriage? If it was, then it is community property and half is yours. Um, it would be the choice of the grantor to choose who they wanna leave the property to or their half of the property to. If that person is the surviving spouse, A. If it is not, C. Okay, I'm trying to get through all of these. How quickly can a beneficiary sell a property after my death? Will a title company give clear title immediately after my beneficiary files the affidavit of death and other documents? Yeah, give it a couple weeks. Um, if you pass away, 
the person survived, remember the person survives you by 120 hours, okay? They take the affidavit of death, they file it. They should get a certified copy back, just like after recording return to on the transfer on death deed, there's the same thing on the affidavit of death. They get that back, okay? And then that's it. They go to a realtor and the realtor is gonna say, well, let me do a title search, right? They search title and they can see literally from where you filed the transfer, well, from when you purchased it in 1983, from when you filed the TOT, from when they filed the affidavit of death, um, they can trace title um, and making sure that no one else has filed anything else um, with regard to it, the person will be clear to sell it. There shouldn't be anything hindering them, nor do I believe there's some sort of five-year waiting period or anything like that. There's nothing like that in the code, I don't think. Um, so they can go do what they want with it. My only concern is that people don't have conversations prior to doing this. They just leave it to a beneficiary and then the kids are fighting because they did equal shares when really only one child should have had it. Okay, let me scroll up. Thank you, Vera. Okay. Hmm, the property is listed in my trust. Is there a reason I might want to do a Todd? Good question. This challenges me, so I appreciate your question. Okay, here's the issue with trusts. I'm not good at them. Um, I, typically, I typically ask my mom about trust because she teaches Will's Trust and Estates. But um, from what I understand, uh, and I don't want to assume that you haven't done this, trusts Typically, trusts are a document. They're a non-probate document. They don't, unless they're inside of a will, which is a testamentary trust. If it's just a trust document, um, it is a contract, okay? And there's a trustee that's appointed and you, it's, the property is, is distributed to the beneficiaries based on the terms of the trust. The problem is a lot of people do not retitle their real property into the name of the trust. So there's just this piece of paper and it, it means nothing until you've gone to your title company and renamed, retitled the real property in the name of the trust or in the trust of John Smith, right? And then it has slash trustee and they show you how to do all that. Um, so make sure first that the trust is properly funded, meaning the trust is actually the owner of the property. The trust has to be the owner of the property. And it isn't just a piece of paper, which not saying you didn't do it, just a lot of people don't. Um, if it's been in, if it's in a trust, that's fine. I mean, and, and it's been, um, pro and your trust has been properly funded, meaning the real property has been titled into the trust. I don't see a need to do a Todd on, but only if the trust has been properly done, meaning it's been drafted properly. And if it hasn't been, I would, I would worry. Um, but I would also have someone look at the trust document if it was not done by an attorney. I hope that answered your question. If you include your real property in an LLC, can you use a Todd? I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> Send me an email, Doris. I know someone that I can ask. I can ask that. Uh, Bruce McGovern, he teaches agency and partnership. Um, and I took him when I was in law school and he works in the clinic now. So I will, I will ask him if you can send me an email at cwashington at stcl.edu. I'm happy to try to get that question answered for you. I know nothing about LLCs. Thank you, Laura. Okay, the title on my home has my married name. However, I'm currently using my maiden name. For the Todd, which name should I use? Go ahead and do both names and do an a, also known as in between, like A, K, A, okay, of all the names, so that when it's filed, there's no confusion about who you are and who, the, who this person is, okay? 
especially if you have like a common name, that can be uh, problematic too. I don't think in the long run it'll cause any issues for your beneficiary, Julia. Um, I just want, I'm just kind of a perfectionist. I want everything done like perfectly so that no one can argue that's not really her. That was somebody else. Okay. The property is in the name of the trust and also contains a pour over will. So good. Yeah, I think you're good. Um, if you're having concerns about the way, if you don't have any concerns about the way the will or the trust was drafted and it's fully funded, I wouldn't worry about going to get a Todd. Okay. Okay. I'm just trying to get through all of these. All right. Okay, uh, which is better to name a beneficiary in the existing deed or to name them in a Todd? I, I'm, not, I'm not understanding the question. I think maybe, are you asking, I'm, are you wanting to do a transfer during your lifetime or after your death? The difference is with a Todd, the transfer happens after your death. And with like just deeding, like drafting a special warranty deed, that takes effect now. Like I'm giving my property to someone else now, like while I'm alive. So that's, there's a huge difference. Um, are there inheritance tax issues with the Todd? I don't know. This came up a few semesters ago. One of my students who was like a stockbroker or something at one point, um, he, he looked into this. I, I don't know. There could be, I, I don't know. I don't know for sure. But again, if you'll shoot me an email, I can figure it out for you. Yes, yes. Um, if uh, Here's my question again. Can non-married partners use this form to leave their half of a primary residence to the other partner? Yes, it's just that um, they would not be um, in the married category. So it wouldn't be A or B, it would be C. Um, and they would actually have to own the property together, okay? Or if it's just you that owns it, of course you can leave it to whoever you want. Permitted, it's your property. Okay. Okay, hey, Denver, um, can you unmute yourself and just ask the question you're trying to ask? I wanna hear, yeah. Yeah, the, the question was if you were to add them to the deed now, so the deed is in my name, and if I wanted to leave it to my daughter to put her in the deed right now, is that better? I mean, obviously she she would have rights to the property now, but um, is that better than putting it in the tot and giving it to her after death? It's a personal family decision. I've done both. Um, I had a client recently who really, um, she was getting up in age, um, she did not want to be bothered with contractors and fixing up the properties. And so she wanted me to deed her property to her daughters. And I was like, now? She said, now. That's what she wanted to do. And I had to grill her to make sure she wasn't under any pressure because she's kind of like over 65. I want to make sure there was no undue influence or anything like that. And it, it's just a family decision. Talk to the beneficiaries and ask them what their intentions are with regard to the property. Make sure that you're not, and I don't know your family, probably a great family, um, most are. Uh, make sure they're not doing anything that's gonna dispossess you of your property. Meaning you're deeding this property to people while you're alive and you're giving up your bundle of rights to the property. So just be sure that there's an agreement there that you're gonna be able to still live there. Do you trust these people? I mean, of course you do, right? Um, just make sure all the ducks are in a row. 
I think that the Todd is safer because you're not giving up any property rights now. It's only upon your death, right? But if there's something that needs to be done now and say daughter is the only one who can do it and you really want her to just have the property, you can do whatever you want. It really is a personal family decision. It's totally subjective. Uh, I will do whatever the client wants me to do. It's just that in situations like these, I make sure that they are absolutely certain because they are giving up their house now. I hope that addressed your question. I hope. Yes, thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for your question. Um, oh, thank you, Julie, I appreciate it. Um, Okay, wouldn't that be considered a gift and then there would be taxes? Also, you will lose your 65 and up status for taxes if you have another owner. I'm, confu I'm a little bit confused about the question. Also, I'm not an expert in estate and gift tax taxing. If you give it during your lifetime. Um, I mean, yeah, yeah, you're right. So if you transfer, like, yes, you're absolutely right. So if you transfer your property and you're over, you're, you're enjoying the benefits of the exemptions of being 65 and up, right? If you transfer your property, oh, oh, I'm sorry, okay. Okay, y'all could hear me for the last 20 minutes, right? Okay, um, so, yeah, and I've had this happen too. So this used to be part of my Todd presentation. I have had like, or, or I make a joke that like someone who's 30 years old, who's young and comes to my office and says, yeah, my mom, you know, she passed away. She left me this property. She had like a 65 and up exemption. So yeah, like I'm 30, but it applies to me. No, it doesn't. Um, you have to be 65 and up also. And they're going to, yeah, it, it, you don't inherit someone else's tax exemption. You must reapply yourself for that exemption and you won't qualify if you're 30. So you're right about that. Um, as, as far as the estate and gift taxing, I, I can't answer that question. Yeah, I can give you the contact information, Rose. Um, so I'm assuming you want the phone number and here is email. Okay. And okay. All right, so um, any other questions? Can you un oh, oops. Okay, my contact information is in there. Okay, so um, if you have a question, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, I feel like I've literally been talking to myself this entire time. So if you have any questions, let me see your face, something. And if you don't know where the unmute button is, it's this little microphone down on the left-hand side of your screen. Hello, may I ask a question? Sure. Okay, um, I, w I had a hard time getting in and so um, I had to call into the office and so I'm just listening to you, I can't not see you. Um, okay. Can you, uh, will I be able to get a copy of the, the, the email, I'm sorry, of the, the program or the slides that, you, that you're doing, will we be able to get that in writing? Sure, I'm happy to get the slides uh, over to Chandra um, or you can email okay. me. Um, the, usually okay. during these presentations, we would all be in person and we would have the PowerPoint printed off and you'd follow along and you'd have your own deed. 
I, I did I can't do that right now, unfortunately, but um, I can make that available to you um, and to everyone else um, once this is over. Oh. I will do it as soon as we get off of the um, the Zoom. Okay, great. And your email? C. Washington. Are you able to give that to me? Yes, I'm sorry, say that again. C. Washington uh -huh. at, at S is in Sam, T is in Tom. C as in cookie, L as in lemon, dot edu. Can I repeat that, please? That That's uh, C Washington at stcl dot edu. Yes, that's it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. No, thank you for coming. I appreciate it. This is Chandra with AARP. I added my information to the chat area. However, if you, I just realized that some people may have called in. Um, I have gotten a few messages that they got kicked off. Uh, but if you just called in and you're not able to see the chat area, then the number you can reach me at is 832-325-2231. Again, that's 832-325-2231. Uh, the plan is to get this um, this uh, actual Zoom uh, information edited and, and put on the AARP Texas YouTube channel. Um, AARP uh, Texas does have a statewide YouTube channel where you can find all sorts of information and learnings and uh, just, uh, just basically all the stuff that we've been doing this year since COVID. We're trying to put it in one area so that folks can have access to it. If there are uh, well, another round of questions, if you have questions, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask a question. We've got about nine minutes here. I missed an important one in the chat. Um, if the property is left to a special needs uh, daughter, what do you suggest I use? Um, definitely um, understand your situation. Um, I would go ahead and seek the help of it of an attorney with this one. There is something called a special needs trust um, where you can transfer property to uh, a, an individual uh, with special needs and their ability to get uh, benefits will not be affected. I do not draft those, um, it, but um, it, it can be done. The Todd would not be a good idea because it outright gives the property to someone who may or may not be able to um, have the capacity to execute that, uh, the follow-up documents, and then a will uh, for the same reason. Um, I would appoint a trustee over the trust, but to actually draft um, a special needs trust, um, I, don't, I don't do those, but no, you would not do a Todd for that. Um, and if you were to do a will, I would do a trust for that. Linda Garcia. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Hi. What's your question? Uh, I'm just listening right now. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> you your name kept popping up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was like, Linda Garcia. Great. Can you transfer to someone over 18 or 21? Yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah, you have to be um, 18 in order to like own real property. Um, so yeah, they would have to be 18 at least by the time you passed away. Any more questions or comments? I'm getting one more in here. Okay. <laughs> Okay, when I was explaining the alternate beneficiary, the storm came and ended our power that has just come back on. I'm so sorry, because that's the most confusing part, part of the presentation. I would, to, I would to have the form since in the past, my realtor and his title company said they were not able to gain access to the form. Okay, um, go ahead and shoot me an email um, and we can chat after the um, presentation is over. I'll put my email on the screen right now. I mean, in the chat right now. Yeah, feel free to 
ask me questions about that. We can get the forms out to you. Crystal, you did uh, suggest this legalhelp.org uh, website. Uh, yeah, texaslawhelp.org. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me put it in the chat again. This is this has all of those forms, like the the transfer on death deed, the instructions, the cancellation deed, the affidavit of death, um, the revocation and cancellation form. It's got all of that on it. TexasLawHelp.org. I've got that down. TexasLawHelp.org. Oh, I see it this time. Okay. That's <laughs> my question. All right. Any more questions, comments? We're at about uh, eleven thirty-five, and we just want to be respectful of time. Um, I want to go ahead and uh, thank Crystal and South Texas College of Law for being a wonderful partner and uh, partnering with AARP. Uh, and don't worry, we're going to do some more of these um, if um, Crystal and I can get together and get some dates available. We will uh, certainly do at least one more before the year ends. Uh, I know the transfer on death deed is one of the uh, simplest ways if you, you know, to do this. So we're going to uh, have this one. And we're also, I'd like for her to do the uh, estate planning again. And we're also going to get this up on our YouTube channel again. Just if you're on your Google machine, just go to AARP uh, and YouTube and you can find our, um, our um, YouTube channel. Uh, give me a few days to get it up. Uh, I've got to go through our different processes for getting that approved. And then we have to do a little bit of editing to it as well. Um, one last time, any more questions for Crystal before we adjourn? Oh, um, go ahead. Can you hear, can you hear me? Yes, we yeah. can hear you. Go ahead. Um, question, uh, Jane and I have been together for, uh, over 50 years now. The house is in her name. Uh, she's a little bit older than I am and she's reminding me that she may pass before I do. Uh, any way to preserve the properties tax status that uh, she originally got set uh, when she purchased the house? Okay. Uh, so I'm, I'm hearing, okay, so when was the property purchased? So is it Jane who, pro who purchased the property? Yes, Jane purchased it in her own name. Okay, what year? Uh, good question, Jane, you know? Not off the top of my head. Okay. Uh, De decades ago. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Okay. It's forward, it's all. But okay. I get a, I get a, you know, you, you can freeze your educate your educational tax at a certain age school, that, school tax school tax well that pass over to him if i if it's in his if he has the d okay so if you transfer your um your property to him upon your death are you're asking does does the tax exemption transfer automatically to him is that what you're asking Right. No, it doesn't. Uh, but here's the thing. I'm not an expert in tax matters, but one thing I do know is that tax exemptions are person specific. They're not attached to a home. They're attached to a person who's in the home. Based on either their age or whatever, um, a person who inherits a piece of property will have to reapply for an exemption in their own name. Okay. Once they inherit the property. She, she's 80 and I'm 77. Okay. And uh, I, I think what you're saying is that if I inherit property, the house that we live in from her, that the school tax rate will be reset to the higher rate that's currently in existence. I don't know that for sure. I would check with them. I would check with them. The only tax exemption that I'm 
familiar with is the 65 and up exemption. I don't know. I would contact them. I would actually call them and say, listen, if she dies, what, what, what happens? You know, if I'm the, ben if I'm the beneficiary of this property, like that's a, that's an administrative answer. Uh, who, who's, them, to that dish. Huh? who's them in this case? So this, you said the school tax. Uh, I, yeah, uh, just general, the property taxes. I, I'm, I'm mildly concerned that the property taxes will shoot up if I'm the survivor uh, and the house is transferred to me. Right. Yeah, I would contact the... Um, it's, it wouldn't be the appraisal district because is, is, if that's the property tax... I mean, I would contact the appraisal district first. That would be my first, but I'm not, I'm really not sure. I'm not familiar with this, with the school tax and how they work, but wherever you get the bill from, I would contact those people and ask them. Okay. It's not a legal answer. It's more of an administrative answer. Like, what are they going to do? Does it go away when she passes away or does it stay permanently attached to the property? My my experience from the 65 and up exemption is no, no benefits attached to a person automatically. But I don't know that for sure. I would call them. Sorry, I can't be of more help with regard to that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, they said HCAD could answer. That's where I would start as the appraisal district. All my tax questions go to the appraisal district, whatever county I'm in. Um, yeah, I wonder if put you on the deed now. Can you hear her? She's wondering if... It's a, it's a tax question. Yeah, if, if uh, I was put on the deed now, would the property tax stay the same? Or would that addition of me to the deed cause a new uh, reset of the property tax? Yeah, I think it's the same answer. I mean, I would contact the Harris County, it's, it's, I'm assuming the property is in Harris County, Fort right. Bend County appraisal, Harris County appraisal, give them a call before you do anything. That is, that's a big move. You want to make sure that everything's going to stay the same. My inkling is that they're going to say no. Now that there are two owners on the property, one has to be to meet, one has to meet the same exemption in order to, for it to apply to them. So I think there has to be something done administratively, like I've never heard of property exemptions being passed automatically without something being done. So I'd start with the appraisal district. That's a question for them for sure. And, and also I, I uh, messaged you asking a question whether my mineral rights are property in the sense I could transfer on death to- Good her. question. Good question. Yeah, I think that mineral rights, well, there's mineral rights. So I think anything with a legal description, a real property legal description can be passed. There are certain things called surface rights. And then um, it's, it's a lot of, there's a lot of oil and gas law in there. So if it has a legal property description, meaning it can be actually substantiated with a legal property description, I think you can pass it. Um, it's just, are the mineral rights attached to the surface or were those transferred apart from the surface, the, the actual tangible real property? So with the property comes the rights, but were they sold? Like if you allowed someone to come and drill on that property, um, did you already transfer those out and keep the surface rights or do you not have those anymore? Because I think you can transfer the land. The property was sold with the retention of mineral rights. Actually, I inherited them yeah. from, from my mother. Right. Then I think when you're transferring the real property, I think you're transferring the mineral rights also. They haven't been given to someone else. Okay. Yeah, did, did you just just say that my mineral rights would be applicable for a, a Todd? So I said that if the mineral rights have not already been transferred to someone else, like I've heard of surface rights and then the rights to the actual minerals underneath, okay? 
if those have never been severed, if those have never been separated, then when you transfer the surface, you are transferring the minerals. If they mm -hmm. have been severed, you're not, you're only transferring the surface. And then you transfer it to a new owner and they're wondering why someone can come drill on their property or someone's on their property drilling and it's because the mineral rights have been transferred, okay? But if they haven't, then they do necessarily pass together. Okay, I, I own the mineral rights. Uh, the property surface was sold a long time ago before mom died because she was tired of dealing with it. Okay, why don't you just send me an email while this is, when this is over? I want to make sure that I'm addressing, you know, your issue properly. But thank you for your question. Any more questions? All right. Um, well, again, thank you, Crystal. Uh, thank oh, you. Yes. South. Oh, go someone else. But go ahead. Nope, that's it. We're good. Okay, we're good. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. We do appreciate and thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, look out for more information from AARP. You can visit us at aarp.org forward slash Houston, or you can just Google AARP Houston and you can find all sorts of events and things that we're doing. Thank you again. Have a wonderful weekend and please, whatever you do, be safe. Please Thanks be safe. Thank y'all so much. Take care. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Bye-bye.